What's the question that you receive most often when, when you do your events? Well, you deal with it very much in your own book, uh, which, by the way, I should say one of the finest I have read. I need to go back to it. Uh, I was reading it as I was preparing to come here. What an amazing sweep of sensitive knowledge, Ben. I Thank that brain that God has given to you. Uh, you know, I think it ought to be required reading uh, if any university professors have the courage to do it. Uh, but as I look and uh, sort of do these navigational things, the two toughest questions to me, uh, you know, once upon a time, the cosmological, the teleological, and all of these ontological arguments were richly debated on the campus. But now they are more culturally sensitive issues that are raised. However, the one thorn in the side of the theistic framework is the problem of evil, the problem of pain, the problem of suffering. And I think what someone once said, virtue in distress and vice in triumph has made atheists of mankind. I think it's the most real question, frankly. And many of the philosophers who ultimately, David Hume himself, you know, did away with the notion of a sovereign first cause. Uh, for them, this was the thorny question. So to me, how can an all-powerful and an all-sovereign God uh, and an all-good God allow so much of pain and suffering in this world? I think it's a legitimate question, but that's the one. Today, it's much more cultural issues, uh, so many things that you've dealt with. Uh, I think the relevance of uh, a, a moral law that the Chris Judea Christian worldview invokes that we are not just beings intended to reason, but reason morally. Uh, that, those are the debates, I think, the two issues, and I think they are connected. So let's talk about the problem of suffering and pain. Okay. Obviously, there have been a, a, a bunch of religious thinkers who have yeah. taken this on. It's always puzzling to me when you hear secular humanists and atheists suggest that it's a revelation that this is a yeah. problem for religious thought. Obviously, yeah. it's been a problem for religious thought since the very yeah. beginning. What do you think is the is the best answer to that very difficult question? Well, uh, you know, Job is the one who wrestled with it the most. Job, to me, came up with a very incredible answer. And that's, to me, a softer touch today, but I think a profound touch for those of us who have that knowledge of God. To him, when he said, I had heard of you by the hearing of my ear, now I see, have seen you, I abhor myself, and I'm horrified, and he repented. That relationship with God, same as with uh, Habakkuk, you know, they struggled with these issues, but that divine encounter gave them a pair of eyes so that they could see to the problem from a very different perspective. God is, God acts, God changes. That's what Habakkuk came up with, you know, the actuality of God in distinction to atheism, the eventuality of his working in distinction to deism, and the eternality of his perspective in distinction to, to pantheism. So the question itself is well answered within the Judeo-Christian worldview. But I think as a culturally relevant apologist, this is the way I deal with it, Ben, and I found it to be quite effective because the, the wheels start turning. I was at the University of Nottingham years ago when it was first thrown at me. And a guy stood up and he just said, how can you possibly talk of a good God, of goodness, when there's so much evil in this world? How can you talk about a God that actually exists in this kind of evil and this kind of suffering? That, of course, Richard Dawkins uh, and all of them raised the same. So I looked at him and I said, let me ask you this. You're talking about evil? He said, yes. I said, when you say this evilly, aren't you assuming that such a thing is good? He said, yes. I said, when you say that such a thing is good, aren't you assuming that such a thing is a moral law by which to distinguish between good and evil? He paused for a moment on that one. And then I referenced him to Bertrand Russell's debate with Copleston, in which Copleston looked at Russell and said to him, how do you differentiate between good and bad? And Russell said the same way I differentiate between blue and green. And uh, Copleston said, but wait a minute. You differentiate between those colors by seeing, don't you? He said, yes. He said, how do you differentiate between good and bad, Mr. Russell? He paused and he said, on the basis of my feeling, what else? I think that was the weakest point of Russell's debate. So when I looked at him, he said, all right, I will agree to you that there is a moral law, the basis of which to differentiate between good and evil. I said, evil, therefore good. Good, therefore a moral law, the basis of which to differentiate between good and evil. I said, but if you posit a moral law, you must posit a moral law giver, but that's whom you are trying to disprove and not prove. Your whole point is 
invoking a moral law, which you cannot invoke without a moral law giver. So your problem of evil actually disappears with the false assumptions that you're making. Do you know, Ben, he paused and he looked at me and he said, what then am I asking you? I was with William Lane Craig, whom you uh, had on your program. William Lane Craig and I were on a program with a physicist by the name of Bernard Lycan and a pantheist by the name of Jitendra Mohanty, sponsored by Emory, Emory University years ago. And this was thrown back at me. Why do you need to posit a moral law giver? All right, we'll grant you there is this abstract moral law. Why do you need to posit a moral law giver? And my answer is this, Ben. Every time the problem of evil is raised, it is either raised by a person or about a person, which means the questioner assumes persons have intrinsic worth. And that is an assumption they cannot make in a random evolutionary universe with no primary mind and personal being as our creator. So if we have the random collocation of atoms, how do we attribute essential worth to ourselves? So the person component is vital to the question. And so the moral law needs a moral law giver if persons are to have essential worth. So to me, the problem of evil when it is raised is a self-stultifying problem because it has to assume a framework that it cannot arrogate to itself in a random universe without personal value.